Good morning. How are you? Good. I'm glad you're here. Anybody been in a pit this week? Did you find yourself at the tire shop? Just, let me just see your hand. You don't know what that means. Last week, that was where I spent a little time on the Saturday. But all of us spend time in the pit, right? And Joseph is the story that is connected with us probably more. I mean, I see it everywhere I go. And he's, he's a figure that is bigger than just that time in the Old Testament when he was blessed by God. He's a story for every one of us. Because sooner or later, God's going to do what he promised. It may not seem fair, and how God chooses to do what he purposed may not seem exactly the way you would have chosen, but remember, he's God and you're not. It's a great little truth to keep in mind. God doesn't make mistakes. He's not late. He's not early. He's right on time. And what you're about to read and experience with me is simply evidence that you don't give up. God will do what he promised. Now, the idea, we're in chapter 41. If you got your Bible, Genesis, go to chapter 41. And let me recap What's happening in chapter 41 and what got us here? Joseph, as a young man, 17 years of age, was sold into slavery by his brothers. Any of you got brothers like that? Uh, you, know, you know what Joseph went through. He was sold into slavery, literally, carried down to Egypt. He gets to Egypt, and he does everything right. And everything that happens to him is not fair. But God has a plan. And so as Joseph spends time in prison, finally, there comes a day when Joseph is finally remembered. All right? So Joseph had a gift, and his gift was he interpreted dreams. And he interpreted them everywhere he went. I mean, it was like everywhere he went, God put somebody in his life that needed a little help with their dream. So there was a moment when a guy who was the cupbearer for the king had a dream, and Joseph told him what it was. It was a good thing. And that cupbearer got exalted and became the cupbearer again for the king. But he forgot about Joseph. That is until Pharaoh started having a dream. And I'm going to relate the dream to you. It's, it's, you can read it in chapter 41. Great, great story. But here's the dream. Pharaoh had a dream that he saw seven cows come up out of the Nile. Now, they were plump cows. Okay, they were plump, very healthy, beautiful cows. But then seven cows that were skinny and ugly swallowed up the beautiful plump cows. Now, guys, this is not about body image. This is about cows, okay? So don't make the jump anywhere here, okay? The skinny cows ate up the fat ones. And then it didn't even look like they'd eaten. And then he had a dream that there was a stalk of corn and seven beautiful ears of corn. And then all of a sudden, there were these skinny ears of corn that overtook and consumed the beautiful corn. And so he's like, what in the world is going on? And while he's sharing this to his staff, one of his staff was that cupbearer. And it's been two years since that dude was in prison with Joseph. But he goes, hey, I know a guy that might be able to interpret that for you. And he goes, who's that? Well, I was in prison with him. Remember when you threw me in prison? That's the guy. I was in prison with a guy named Joseph, and I think he can help you with this. So all of a sudden, Joseph has this moment, and he's going to get to tell the Pharaoh what the dream means. So in chapter 41, he goes in, and Pharaoh says, hey, this is what I'm having. This is the dream. And, and Joseph goes, okay, here's, here's the deal. Those seven beautiful cows represent seven wonderful years of prosperity you're going to have, king. But then the ugly cows, the skinny cows, that represents seven years of famine. Same thing with the corn. The seven years of really beautiful corn is 
Seven good years, and then there's going to be seven bad years. And he said, King, you need to make sure you have somebody helping you who can make wise decisions and be ready for this to happen. Now, that's all he said. He didn't say, "Uh, King, I know who that would be. That would be me. He didn't advance himself. He just said, King, you need to have somebody helping you. And you need to have a man who's wise and who can help you in preparing for these years. Now, verse 33, watch what happens. This is so cool. In verse 33, he basically says, Pharaoh, you need to select a wise man, set him over the land of Egypt, and proceed to appoint overseers and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. In other words, when things are good, make sure you store it up. Okay, put it in the bank and get ready because you're going to need it in just a little bit. And then he said, and gather all the food from these good years that are coming and store it up under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur so that the land may not perish through the famine. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this? Meaning somebody to help me? Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there's none so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house. All my people shall order themselves as you command, only as regards the throne Will I be greater than you? In other words, only because I am the Pharaoh of Egypt will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said, Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand. He put it on Joseph's hand. He clothed him in garments of fine linen. He put a gold chain about his neck. Got the bling going. I mean, look, look at this picture. He is dressing him up of everything Pharaoh had. He's giving it to him. And then he made, this is, this is a great part. He made him ride in his second chariot. In his second chariot, he rode around, and they called out before him, bow the knee, and thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Now, we'll just pause there. It, it goes on and, and, and tells more of the story. But think about this. At 17 years of age, Joseph had a dream that one day his brothers would bow down to him. One day his brothers would need him. And he didn't know what that meant. And it's now 13 years later. He's 30 years old. And now, after being in prison, after prison, lied about falsely accused, now the, the king, which Pharaoh was the king of Egypt, looks at him and says, you're my guy, and it's all yours. Who would have thought? Now, that's the part of the story we all like. That's the part, hey, that's what I've been waiting for. But waiting is really hard. When it's not fair, When God is taking too long. Let me give you a verse out of the New Testament that kind of sums up this whole process. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we're going to reap. If we do not give up, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. I can promise you the enemy wants you to give up on God. Your enemy, the devil, wants you to say, God's not fair. Or else this wouldn't be happening to me. And this whole series has been about, it, is, is life really fair? Can I just remind you, fair is where you take your show pig. It's not where you live. Because God shows us in this. He is righteous and wise in all his ways. But trusting while waiting 
is the most essential, important ingredient to the fulfillment of God's plan for you. Can I say that again? Trusting Him while you're waiting is the most important ingredient in God's dream for you. And yet it's the hardest thing to do. In fact, if I could sum up two simple things out of this, out of this text, one would be this, waiting on God is harder than working for God. We all want to work for Him. We all want to fix things. We want to right the wrongs. I mean, we want to be busy. Trusting God is the ultimate evidence of our faith. It's not how loud you sing. It's not the money you give. It's not how many times you show up at a church. Let me tell you, the greatest way to demonstrate your faith is trust Him when you don't understand Him. That's what God is looking for. So let's start with the first one. Waiting on God. Guys, waiting is not easy. It's never easy. We, we want to fix, okay? Now, it, it kind of is like a husband and wife relationship. Um, I learned a long time ago, but I'm still learning the lesson. Evidently, I didn't pass the first several times. When Rachel comes to me with an issue or a problem, she's not looking for a fix. She's just looking for me to hear and to listen to her. But I want to run to the solution. I want to fix things. I want to interrupt and say, oh, well, let me tell you what I would do. You know, they call that mansplaining, right? And it doesn't go over well with your wife. It doesn't go over well with him. You don't see what he sees. You can't possibly know what he knows. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he died, there are these soldiers that show up to arrest him. And they come in there running, man. They got clubs. They got swords. They got all kind of stuff. And when, when this starts going down, there's one disciple who says, no, this isn't right. This isn't fair. And he grabs his sword. And he's going to save Jesus. He's going to save the day. And he cuts a guy's ear off. The guy's name was Malchus. We know it from the gospel accounts. And Jesus looks at him and says, put your sword back. Who was that disciple? Out of the 11 that were left, which one do you think would be the one to pull a sword and say, I'm going to save the day? Peter. I just think we all are like Simon Peter. We're going to save the day. We're going to fix things. We're, I'm tired of waiting. God must need some help. You know what? If he needed help, he'd let you know. But he needs your trust. He needs you to wait patiently. So he pulls his sword and cuts a guy's ear off. Jesus goes over just like Jesus picks the guy's ear up, puts it back on. Jesus has spent a lot of his time on this earth fixing what we messed up. And yet, he looked at Simon Peter and said this, if you live that way, you're going to die that way. Because you're going to run into somebody you can't fight. And then he said, do you not remember, I can call on my father and he will send me 12 legions of angels, 72,000 angels. And according to the Old Testament formula, one angel can destroy 185,000 warriors. So what he was saying is, do you really think I need you, Simon Peter? And then he says, by the way, this is the way the Scripture says it must be. In other words, there's a plan here. God's doing something here. If we could just get that lesson. It doesn't look fair to you. But maybe God's doing something in the process that you can't see. Charles Stanley he said of all the principles of Scripture, the one that stood out to him the most is the concept of waiting on the Lord. I tell you, it's the hardest. We don't like to wait for anything. I, I don't know how many of my brothers in here and sisters that just don't like to wait. Do you know how much time we spend waiting on our phone? In a given lifetime, they estimate we'll spend, ready? Nine years of our life waiting on a phone, on the phone, do, trying to get something, trying to look. Do you know every year in Central Florida, every year, you know how much you wait in traffic? Again, this is an estimate. You wait over two days every year. 
I waited one day this weekend, so I know I got I'm caught up. I don't have but one to go, so I'm good to go. We all deal with waiting, and we deal with it differently. But when it comes to God, here, here you know what the issue is? But God, if you're in control and you're all-powerful, it should happen. Stephen Furtick said this, the only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing you had. Now think about that a minute. The only thing worse is wishing you had awaited. Because see, what we don't understand is that God has a plan. And God is working. His timing is perfect. He's not early. He's not late. His timing is perfect. And so you can save a lot of time. Just wait on him. Let God do what God is doing. Because you know what he's doing while we're waiting? He's working. He's working. And he's doing something you can't see and you can't even imagine. John Piper said, that miserable, uncomfortable, painful silence is one of God's most powerful tools to set us free. And I can tell you that it's in the waiting that we learn so much about God. So waiting is hard. In fact, it's even harder than it is working for God. But waiting while you trust. The basic, the most important element is trusting God. And what does that mean? It just means that we accept, as Tim Keller said, we accept whatever God brings into our life, even if we don't understand it. Trusting means you accept it, even though you don't understand it. You know Tim Keller passed. He died of cancer. And I'm, I'm thinking, God, if there was anybody that I would want to keep on this earth, wouldn't it be a spokesman like that? Wouldn't it be somebody pastoring in New York? But Keller said, no. Trusting means you accept it into your life, even though you, you don't understand it. And you know, have you ever heard the saying, trust the process? I, and we've probably said it, trust the process. No, I'm not trusting the process. Who's in charge of the process? I trust God, not the process. If it's his process, I'm good to go. But it's not just I trust a process. I trust a living God who has me in the palm of his hand and who is working something out. So trusting God is more about who he is than it is what he's doing. Once I know who he is, it doesn't matter what he's doing. Once I understand God and I believe in God and I get it, who he is, well then I'm, I'm good to go. God, you take as long as you want because I know who you are and I trust you. So while you're waiting, trust him. He's got a plan. And you know what that plan is? Before you were born, I think God had a plan for every one of us. I think that plan was to draw us close to himself and to open a door that we could know him, we could walk with him, just like Adam and Eve did before sin entered in. I think God has this plan to restore us to the Garden of Eden, to restore the relationship that was lost when man sinned against God. And the only way to be restored is through his son, Jesus Christ. So God gives us his son, Jesus dies on a cross, not for his sin, but ours. And by believing in him, we now are restored to a relationship with God. And now every day we live with a sense of his presence, and he is literally in us and all around us. And God is now executing his plan. He's working this plan out because the plan goes like this. He wants you to grow as close to him as you can possibly grow to become like his son, Jesus. So everything that happens in my life goes by him first. And he uses every bit of it to make me more like Christ. I mean, you've, you've seen the wood carvings. They're amazing. Wood carvers fascinate me. They can take a piece of, piece of wood and they can make this incredible thing. I heard about a, a carver in Tennessee and his specialty was coon dogs. 
Uh, he just loved to carve dogs, and they would be baying. They'd be up on the tree barking at a coon that was up in the tree. And, and he could make them look like they're real. I mean, the hairs on that dog. And somebody asked him, how do you do that? He said, I just take a stick of hickory and cut away everything that doesn't look like a coon dog. Do you know what God, our God is doing? He's cutting away everything that doesn't look like his son. He's cutting away things in your life that don't look like Jesus. So that he is accomplishing what he set out to accomplish. And he's going to keep working on you until the day you're with him. Well then, but what about those things that happened to me last week? And what about the tire shop? What about all those hard things I've been through? God's using them. Let me give you one of the greatest verses that were, was ever penned to remind us of what God is doing. This is Romans 8, 28. This is what he says. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That is God's plan for you in one sentence. Well, two sentences. I mean, it, it's God's plan. For we know, there are two Greek words for know. There's one, gnosko. It means I know something with my head, like I know the sun's shining out there. I hadn't seen it today, but I know it's out there. There's another word, oida, that means, oh no, I know it with my heart. I know for sure because I've experienced it. Guess which one this one is? This is Paul saying, I know this for sure. We're talking about a man who was shipwrecked. We're talking about a man who was beaten and left for dead. We're talking about a guy that was fed to the lines in one place. I mean, everything that's happened to Paul, he said, I know this. God is working all things together for good. Now, I, want you to, I just want you to hear this and apply it to your life. This does not say that all things that happen for everybody is going to be good. You follow me? It's not a promise to everybody. It's very specific. For those who love God. That's why I say the first step is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith in Him. Surrender your life. Then... Follow him. And that's when this plan and this promise actually becomes real. It becomes your story. It is not a promise blanket to anybody in the world. Oh, yeah, everything's going to work out for good. No. But I can tell you there may be some in the room who've never put their faith and trust in Christ. I believe that the goodness of God leads to repentance. I believe God's been good to you because he wants to show you so you can trust him. And the first and greatest step is to say, Jesus, I love you. I'm following you. I believe in you. The second thing this verse does not say that all things that happen are good. I'm not about to stand up here and tell you that when life is taken by another human, when a storm comes and destroys some, somebody's possessions and even somebody's life, how is that good? That's not good. That wasn't in the original plan, what God had planned. I mean, there's so many things God is not behind evil. He's not behind sin. So I'm not blaming God for everything that happens. He doesn't cause all things to happen. He's just big enough to take the worst the devil can do to you, and he's going to turn it and spin it and bring the most incredible good in your life. That's our God. He is bigger, stronger than anything this world can throw at you. That's why the prisons, that's why all these things that Joseph experienced that weren't fair, no problem for God. He just kept working through them all to accomplish his plan. And the last thing, I just think we got to remember that God is not behind everything that happens. He's not behind everything. Some things happen because of a bad choice. I'm not about to blame God for some of the stupid things I've done. Though we try to, well, God, if you'd have been better or if you'd have done this, no, no, no. Let's quit blaming. 
I just want you to know we serve a God who can take the worst mistake you can ever make and he can turn it and bring good in your life. That's the God we're talking about. That's the plan that we have while we're waiting. Trust him. Because he takes all those things. See this phrase? He takes all things and works them together for good. All things. By the way, I, I don't know how to explain all things. It's all things. That mean everything? Everything. You know what that is in Greek? All things. I mean, it, it's everything. You'll never live a day or a moment that God can't take what happens in that day and use it to accomplish his plan for your life. And by the way, he works them together for good. That is a word. It's literally a compound verb. It means to create and then together. It means somebody is like a master chef. A master chef. And it's like somebody baking a cake, and they're putting all these ingredients. By the way, my grandkid, uh, grandchildren have gotten me hooked on, is it cake? Y'all ever see that? That's the craziest show. If you'd have told me I'd have been staring at a TV trying to figure out if something's cake, I'd have said, that's crazy. It's a game. I mean, it, it is. It's fascinating. When you make a cake, there's more than one ingredient, right? I mean, I, I'm not a baker, but I know a little bit about it. In your life, there's a lot of ingredients. Some are good, some are bad. When I was a kid growing up, I used to watch my mom, and she always went to the cabinet and got a little bottle that looked like this. Vanilla extract. One day I asked her, because she always just put a few drops. I said, Mom, what does that do? She said, it makes it really good. It tastes great. And so one day when she wasn't home, I said, I'm going to check this stuff out. If a few drops is good, that whole bottle will be even better. And I just turned it up. Don't do that. I'm begging you. <laughs> do not do it. It's the worst tasting stuff. How does something that tastes that bad help make a cake or something that tastes so good? Just like our God who can take some of the hardest moments, the prisons you've been through, the pits that we've had to go through, and all of a sudden he's working it together, and it's accomplishing his plan. And his plan is that we become a lot closer to him. We become a lot more like his son, Jesus. So, where we started, while you're waiting, trust him. And some of you today are waiting. You're not sure what it is that God's doing. Trust Him. And the greatest way I know how to do it is say, Lord, here's my life. I trust you. And we can do that in this moment. I want you to bow with me. With our heads bowed. I know for some in this room, it's been, been a very difficult season of life. And so I'm asking you that even when you don't understand Him, trust Him. For some of you, have been waiting for a prayer to be answered. And he still hasn't answered it yet. He's answered it. Just not the way you want it. Will you trust him? Is there anything about him that would tell you you can't trust him? And I just believe this morning that God is calling us to a place to say, Lord, I'm going to wait on you. And while I'm waiting, I'm trusting you. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, you've never said, Jesus, come in my life, I believe in you. Can I lead you in a simple prayer? Would you say this with me? God, thank you for loving me. There are a lot of things I don't understand about you. But I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sin. And I do believe that he was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. And I believe that he is the Messiah. He is the Lord. And I'll follow him even though I don't understand everything. I want to take the step 
to follow Jesus. In Jesus' name. Now look this way. I, I just think that's where it all starts. And that's where God's plan is underway. No, that plan was in existence before you were born, but it didn't really start until you placed your life in his hands for him to do what only that master chef can do to make something beautiful out of you. And today, we just, I want to thank you for, first of all, following the story of Joseph and going on the journey with us. Uh, it's about to get real good. And by that, I mean Joseph is in charge. He's riding around in that chariot. I'm t I, I would love to see that chariot. Wouldn't you? Man, I think it had some air stuff on it, and it was hopping up and down and sideways. And, you know, he's riding around enjoying the moment, but then all of a sudden he looks up and guess who has come needing help? His family. In fact, he's so moved emotionally, he has to leave, go into a room where they can't see him weep. But that's what God said he was going to do. I'm just telling you, God's not through. And he's not through in your life. And so we're going we're gonna to praise him. When I don't understand him, I'm going to bless his name. When I'm walking through the fire, I'm going to bless his name. When I'm in the fields of plenty, I'm going to bless his name. When I'm in the darkest valley, I'm going to bless his name. I pray that we can respond that way today. So stand with me. As we stand together, if any of you prayed that prayer, you want to talk to somebody about what that step means. We got folks here, and you can text us. Text the word next to 40777. Let's sing this as a reminder to us all. No matter what happens, God, I know you, I trust you, and I will bless your name. Let's sing it to us. Bless God in the sanctuary, bless God in the fields of plenty, bless God in the darkest valley, every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Bless God when my hands are empty, bless God with the praise that cost me, bless God when nobody's watching, every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Bless God when the weapons for me. Bless God when the walls are falling. Bless God cause he goes before me. Every chance I get, I bless your name. Bless God who holds the victory. Bless God for he's always with me. Bless God for he's always worthy. Every chance I get, I bless your name. Every chance I get, I bless your name. Hey, thank you for being with us today. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.